Oh, uh, let's switch this. What does this do? Mini player. Do that. Hello, everyone. So let me know if you can hear me. Oh, thank you very much. You guys, you know what to do. All right, good. So I have a lot of things I want to talk about, but I decided at the very last second, I really want to talk about taking care of Acropora corals. I have not actually focused on that one specifically, and I feel like even though this will be a live stream, I will be doing a standalone edited video of this topic for those that don't want to sit through a long rambling session. I want to tell you, first of all, that SPS corals are a patient's coral. And even when you do everything right, things can go wrong, and they can go wrong quickly. And lots of hard work can be devastated very quickly, hours and days, and it will take months and months to regrow it and get it back to normal. Just one second. Jose, you still have your filter on. <laughs> so I have another house guest here again. I just had one last week. We are back to a standalone single camera. We're using my iPhone to stream this time because I still have not made a decision. And that different topic, Acropora. So an Acropora is a hard uh, SPS coral, which stands for small polyp stony, SPS. And the funny thing about that acronym is it's also standing for stability promotes success. So the more stable your water parameters, the more likely you're gonna have happy corals. I want to encourage you guys to really think about what you're doing and not rush into anything when it comes to their care. So in other words, number one, the tank should be stable for a while. I'd really recommend that the tank be six, nine, 12 months old, but I know some of you won't wait that long. And I get it, you know, it's exciting. But here's the thing, if you buy a lot of corals and you put them in your nice new tank and you aren't taking care of them the way you're supposed to, you're gonna lose all those corals. You have to rebuy them. So you're gonna lose a lot of money. Secondarily, if you spend money on corals instead of on quality equipment, you're gonna end up losing livestock because the equipment was crap and it didn't hold up. And when that happens, you're gonna watch thousands of dollars be lost because you had a really cheap piece of garbage equipment. <laughs> and I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm trying to tell you this so you can decide for yourself what is the best purchase. If you could go to a store and buy anything, I know you would buy the absolute best. If money was no object, you would spend all the money to get the latest state-of-the-art equipment. Sometimes your best bet will be to buy used rather than to buy cheap because used is usually 50% of the price of brand new. So if someone is leaving the hobby and they're selling some high-end equipment at a, an affordable price, you save money and you get good gear. And it's all about the gear when it comes to maintaining a tank. One of the things that has come up recently, I, I briefly touched on it last video, uh, someone specifically told me that no one cares about the live stream crap, it's stupid and I should just feed my tank. And so I make a video of me feeding my tank. What's that, 90 seconds, two minutes? I'm not gonna just do videos of me feeding my tank all the time. That's boring too. My, my effort with this channel is to educate you so you can be successful and have a reef tank like I do. And part of what makes my reef tank, let's call it unique, is because I keep my hands out of it and I don't tinker with it and I just let it grow naturally. I also don't expect miracles. I don't try to attain the impossible. I'm not trying to force the issue when it comes to water quality. Today, when I was looking at my uh, Reef Trace app, which by the way, if you aren't using Reef Trace, I highly recommend it. It works for iOS and for Android. I think there's a new version dropping for Android on Monday. So if you'll check it out, I discovered a new thing I didn't know was even in there. If you enter your magnesium, for example, then to the left of the word compare is a little icon you touch and it will show you the ocean water parameter level of magnesium. It'll show you the recommended number I pick and it will show you the average of all the reef trace users that have entered their magnesium recently. And it's always updating to the latest. And so, you know, I was in phosphate actually when I was entering and I noticed the comparison. It said that of all the reef trace users, the average phosphate level was zero which made me laugh, thinking, wow, you guys have amazing water. Let me add my 0.75 ppm and throw off the whole number. 
<laughs> which I did enter it, but it still said the average was zero. So that tells me a lot of you have very low phosphate. Way to go, congratulations. You are beating me at phosphates. Uh, phosphates are an important number that we want to keep low, but when it comes to acropora care, zero is not a good number. And I'm not going to recommend that you try to attain zero of phosphate or nitrate. Both those numbers need to be a little tiny bit. So basically we're looking at uh, the rule of phosphate is 0 0.03 ppm. That's pretty low, 0 0.03. Three hundredths of a, um, well, <laughs> of a part per million is how much phosphate you'd like in the water. My tank seems to average around 0.1. Uh, it could be 0.25. Currently today it is 0.75. But it actually was 0.75 three weeks ago as well. So my number has not elevated, it's staying there, and I just need to treat to lower the phosphate in my water again, which I will probably today. I'll be talking about that in a few minutes. Right there, hint, hint. Okay. Nitrates should not be zero. If your water is absolute zero nitrate, there's not enough in the water for the SPS corals. Now, I do realize some of you are going to comment in the chat and you're going to say, oh, I've run 0, 0 for 12 years and my corals are booming. Well, you're seeing my reef tank and my nitrates are 40 and my corals are quote unquote booming, or at least they're growing. <laughs> I am not trying to have a tank of the month tank in a matter of mere months. I saw a beautiful reef tank shared on Instagram recently and the guy said that it was three months old and it was full of SPS and it was lots of color and it was really nice and it was very young. And that's great, you know, hopefully he can maintain that and maybe he's got a lot of experience. I know nothing about the owner of that tank. I just know what he said. And he showed his tank with all his SPS corals sitting on like floating rock work in a cube tank. And he had two Vortex on there for flow and the Vortex didn't even have the cages on them. So you saw the propellers just spinning away. And I was wondering, did he remove the cages for the video? Or did he uh, intentionally do them that way? And I asked, and he said, I have not installed the cages yet. And I thought that was interesting because he had a bunch of fish in there and I would think a fish gets too close is gonna get sliced by one of those propellers. So I of course would have the cages on there and it was a 100% SPS reef. There was nothing else in there other than fish. And so it was doing very well because it didn't have to compete with the water quality other animals desire, such as zoanthids that like dirtier water, recordia like dirtier water, LPS corals that need food in the water. SPS likes that pristine water. So a little nitrate, a little phosphate. How much nitrate would I recommend minimum would be around three PPM. If uh, it gets a little higher, like in my tank, it could be that my corals have just tolerated it and then the question in the back of my own mind is, well, how much more would my corals grow if my nitrates were lower? And I've talked about nitrates for quite a bit over the last year because I tried different methods to bring it down that has been unsuccessful thus far. So I might just change a lot of water to lower the nitrate. I might ignore it and just let it be what it is because my reef doesn't seem to mind. I could buy a whole bunch of uh, no pox and use that in my system. I could try a more gradual approach to vodka dosing or vodka sugar vinegar dosing, which is called VSV. I don't know, I haven't you know, really decided. It's sort of like my live stream. I haven't decided what machine I wanna buy yet. And I'm debating every single decision heavily, probably too much until I finally come to a conclusion. Now let's talk about some other parameters. You want your water parameters, your, um, sorry, your water temperature to be very stable. <clears throat> my tank seems to vary about two degrees a day, maybe two and a half. 77 is my low, 79 to 79.5 is my high, kind of varies throughout the day. And part of the problem is I keep my house so cold, my tank cools off at night. So I would have to either increase the heater to come on sooner, like at 78 degrees, or I need to add more fans so it can't quite get up to 79.5, which is another viable option. But again, when I look at my reef tank and everything's doing well, I don't really wanna make any changes. I pretty much leave everything alone. And in that regard, my tank may stand out from others that are constantly making changes, whether they're changing equipment, uh, changing temperature swings, locking it into half a degree swing at the very most. These are factors that we have to keep in mind when you're trying to keep a delicate coral like an SPS coral. 
Let's jump to calcium. You want your average calcium level to be between 375 and 425 ppm. And you're going to need a calcium test kit that can read that way. So there's a lot of brands. There's Salifert, there's Elos, there's Red Sea, uh, Nios. I'm trying to think who else is on the market right now. Yeah, those are some good examples. And you definitely want to use it every single week. So let's talk about testing because I always emphasize, please test your water. Today is Saturday. I tell you guys that every week because I'm telling myself, test my water. Well, guess who hasn't tested his own water until today? I did it. It's done. I've posted my numbers on Instagram. You can go check them out later. Because I did not measure my calcium or, you know, all my water parameters for three weeks in a row. You know, today I finally did it, but I didn't do it last week. I didn't do it the week before. I did it the week before that. So we are literally three weeks from when I tested last. And because of it, the calcium level has risen too high in my frag system, which is being maintained with the dosing system. So I have to make a correction again to bring it down. The water in that tank is measuring, measuring 550. It's much too high. And when you have that much of a high calcium level, it actually stagnates your coral growth. So we want to keep it between 375 and 425. And if, if you test every single week, like clockwork, you can keep it in that zone. You know, maybe it'll be 400, 400, 400, 400, 425, 400, 400. That's great. But when it's 280, 550, 370, 480, <laughs> That's bad, and that is not the way it should be in your reef tank. So you definitely want to dial it in. And part of dialing in, like if you're using two-part dosing, is the constant testing, the slight adjustments of your dosing pump, and then you need to uh, let the corals adapt. You want to avoid the big swings. And as the corals grow, because you're being successful at growing your corals, you will then see there's more demand and they want more calcium. So you're having to dose a higher amount of calcium carbonate to the tank. You're gonna have to dose a higher amount of alkalinity. So what worked originally, as the corals got bigger, it's not enough and you've got to increase the dose, but you have to test and test and test to keep it in that sweet spot at all times. And if you vary outside the sweet spot, that's when things go wrong. You guys have seen the video on my tank of Dwayne's Reef. Uh, I think 40,000 of you saw it. Beautiful SPS reef. He just recently posted in Club Milo's Reef, just posted last night, a bunch of horror pictures. And he was doing it as a lesson for all of us to stay on top of testing. And he said, I neglected my tank. I let things get away from me. I had a couple of issues. I didn't jump on them. And now he's got big swaths of death in his tank and he's lost you know, the core of some beautiful colonies. And he's gonna have to go in, he's gonna have to cut and hack out all the death and re-glue what's living and rebuild from that point. And it's very discouraging as a reef keeper to have to go into your tank and do that. You don't hear me doing that with my tank. You don't hear me talking about crashes and disasters. I work next to my tank all day long. I see it every single day. There are so tiny little things I have to do. They're so minor, they're, they're just nothing. My biggest change was adjusting the output of my calcium reactor. And that was just taking a knob and going ink one day and then the next day, ink, the other day, and then the next, a slight twist, and then the next day I wouldn't have to touch it for two, three days, and I had to touch it a little tiny bit. Well, I'm gonna go into my new solution that has been great for the last six weeks, and you'll hear about that in a moment, but I wanna emphasize staying on top of your water parameters and looking at the numbers is really, really important. And even someone seasoned like Dwayne, who knew by neglecting his tank it was gonna go to crap, He's now suffering some big losses because he didn't stay on top of it for whatever reason. And my reply to him, you know, it was sad to see. And yes, you must cut out the death so it doesn't spread. And thirdly, I told him, I hope that this weekend you can get on there and fix all those problems that have been an issue. So that way your system will be safe because the guy can grow corals. He is so good at it. And to, I know he's got to be super discouraged right this minute. And I'm not even sure what came up in his life that, uh, obstructed him. But look at me. I told you guys you need to test and then I would turn off the live stream. I had the test kits right there on my counter and I didn't test. And then, you know, the next day I'm like, okay, I'll do it tomorrow. And I didn't. And I'm like, well, I'm not moving off the counter until I get this done. And it ended up being three weeks from the last time I tested, which is ridiculous. And testing takes 20 minutes. It's not a big ordeal. 
Uh, one thing I want to emphasize, which you guys already know, and some of you may not because you're new to the channel, test kits usually have about 50 tests in them, which is basically one a week for an entire year. A test kit is not meant to last forever. Just the fact that you have liquid left does not mean the test kit is still good. They do expire, and you do need to toss them out and replace them with a new one. So my recommendation is to grab a Sharpie, open the lid of your test kit, and write the date the first day you open that kit. Today is 9-29-2018. And that way, every time you open the lid, you can verify it's within 12 months of opening that kit. If you don't do that, you're just guessing. Some kits will have an expiration date on the side of them to tell you when it's no longer valid, and that is fine as well, but my general rule is always a test kit's 12 months after that, toss it and buy new kits. Now, alkalinity. Huge, huge, important topic. I did an entire stream about alkalinity, and you can watch that whole one-hour conversation. I can't believe we actually spoke about it for an hour, but the point is we're aiming for a very specific number and staying on that number as long as you possibly can. So the goal is somewhere between 8 and 11 dKH. If you can get it at 8 and keep it at 8 every single day for the next year, you're doing a great job. If you are 8, 13, 9, 7, 8, 11, that's not good. And your SPS corals will not do well. They need very stable alkalinity. When should you dose alkalinity is first thing in the morning because that is when the pH on your tank is the lowest. We want that alkalinity to be, uh, we, we need the alkalinity and we need the pH to be up. So let's just pretend that your tank at four, five, six, seven, eight in the morning is measuring around 7.9. By adding alkalinity to the water during that little window, you'll bring it up to 8.1. And then your lights turn on and photosynthesis takes place and the pH rises throughout the day to 8.2, 8.25, 8.3, maybe 8.31. And then the lights turn off and it starts tapering back down. And it's going down to 8.25, 8.2, 8.19, and it goes all the way down to 7.9, 7.8, 7.7, which is why you dose that alkalinity in the morning. Calcium can be dosed anytime, it doesn't matter. I usually do not like to dose things at the exact same time. And so I've been recommending a 12 hour separation between one and the other. So if you were dosing alkalinity in the morning, I would recommend dosing calcium in the evening. And that way you get both parts added every single day, but there's no interference and you don't have some kind of a weird chemical reaction in your sump to where it precipitates. And the inside of your sump has this big white cloud chalky looking area. One of the things about dosing alkalinity and calcium and magnesium into a sump area, which many people do, is that it's hitting the water in an area where the water is barely moving. I mean, it's moving, but it's very slow. So the solution, I wish I had a little demonstration. Let's use this nice little octopus right here. <laughs> this is your sump area. Your dosing tubes are right here. And this is alkalinity, this is calcium, this is magnesium. And it's trickling in and the water's up here. If you could put a power head right down here pointing straight up that makes the water just tumble all the time. I wouldn't even turn it off. I just plug it in and keep it running forever just some small little tiny adorable power head. Shooting water straight up as the water hits, it mixes instantly. And you don't have any cloud, you don't have any snow, you don't have any flakes, you don't have any sediment in your sump. You're using all the product. If your product is turning white on the bottom and the walls of your sump and the tubes are clogging, you're, it's precipitating out and you're wasting it. It's not helping your system. I just talked with a person who does tank maintenance and he deals with big systems, 300, 400, 500 gallons. And he says, my biggest problem is that sediment gets all inside my sump. It's huge. It's white. It's, it's a mess. And really, it's not even being used because it's just being caked and gluing to the walls of the sump. And it's not benefiting the system. And he was telling me, I have to add so much to keep up with the demands of the tank. And I'm thinking it's because there's a lack of a power head to keep it tumbling and mixing. So it mixes like crazy and it moves through the baffles and goes to the return pump and shoots up. Now, if you have the dosing tubes in your return area and you might have them directly over the return pump, that does not mean it's mixing fast enough for what's trickling out of a dosing pump. Because one of the dosing pumps I'm using is by ice cap. And when that pump is running, it's just like a steady trickle, almost a little stream of all that t chemical hitting the water at once for 90 seconds once a day. 
So by having a power head beneath to blow up, it'll mix it all into the water and the return pump can suck it in and push it into your tank. So we definitely want that to fully mix one way or another, some kind of power head, whether you use a maxi jet that blows that direction or you use a whatever I found, a Macna. It was this big, it was so cute. I, I bought it because it was cute. <laughs> it ended up being the most practical pump I ever bought. I love it. Uh, and you can just set it underneath to blow straight up. Like I said, if the surface of your water is doing this right over the pump, that is perfect. You don't need it to be a geyser. We just want it to be a nice little rolling hill that the liquid is hitting. Now, we've talked about nitrate, phosphate, magnesium, calcium, alkalinity. Let's talk about salinity. Salinity needs to be 1.026. If you have lower salinity, typically your corals are not gonna do well. If you have higher salinity, they're probably not gonna do as well. The target is 1.026. Try to be that spot. The equivalent is 35 PPT and that would be ocean water. So we want to have that number. And I test my tanks once a week, usually, and I try to always get 1.026. And both of my tanks right now are around 1.027. And I think that's because I have been taking humidity out of this house like crazy lately through my air conditioner and my dehumidifier. And I think that it's kind of adjusted my salinity a little bit in both systems. So I'm gonna have to take out some salt water and top off with more fresh water to get the salinity back in, on track. If your tank is ever low on salinity and you're trying to raise it up, uh, an easy slow method would be to fill your top off container with salt water and let it top off with salt water every day until your salinity is back where it belongs. I wouldn't uh, recommend doing that any other time except when you're dealing with trying to raise it up. The rest of the time it's RODI water that we use for top off. Now, Flow, so important for SPS corals. And small, pol small polyp stonies come in different shapes and sizes. And you can look at certain Acropora, like the Humilis, which is a very thick, dense, uh, looks like, mm, like pine cones. It can be hammered with water flow. Those gyre pumps that just shoot so much water through your tank, a Humilis would love it. A Nacropora, on the other hand, would hate it. And that's a very thin, wispy coral. It almost looks like a gorgonian in, in the thickness of the branches. And if you hit that with tons of flow, that coral, the skin will peel off and you'll see white skeleton and, and then you'll have algae and that's the end of it. So you are gonna want to have the right amount of flow for the right type of coral. And that's something that we need to reason our way through for the next two minutes of this conversation. Basically, Anything that's really dense, that's really thick, that can handle a lot of flow, could be directly in the front of a pump that's moving water. If you have more frail things, they can go higher or they can go lower in the tank so they're not getting hit with direct flow. Or maybe that big, thick coral is right here, and you put your frail coral behind it, so as it pounds it, this takes the brunt of it, and lesser flow comes through here, and that little coral can do just fine, here or here. So you want to look at the structure of the corals you're keeping to help you dictate how much flow they can tolerate. We want a lot of flow. So you're going to need some kind of a general rule of thumb. The absolute base amount of flow you want in the display tank is 10 times turnover. So a 100 gallon tank would need 1,000 gallons per hour of flow in the entire tank just to survive, not to thrive. If you wanted to grow SPS corals, the general rule I heard a long time ago and probably still pretty accurate would be 30 times turnover. And there are people out there that have 50 times turnover. So their 100 gallon tank has uh, 5,000 gallons an hour. <laughs> I hate doing math on live camera. <laughs> 5,000 gallons per hour moving through it or higher. And then keep in mind too, flow is dictated on a number of shapes and sizes. Like the Vortec is a cone of flow. The Gyre is gonna be a wave of flow. A MaxiJet is gonna be a stream of flow. A Tunzi uh, would be more of a wide cone shape of flow. So you are gonna determine what pumps you wanna use, where to locate them in your tank, and create a pattern that I love chaotic. I always recommend that your water from different pumps hit each other and crash into each other and ricochet 
and you can kind of see what kind of flow you have in your tank by dropping in flake food once in a blue moon. So you drop it in, and if the flake food just kind of drizzles to the bottom, you have terrible flow. If it shoots to the side like, like confetti that is in a school, that's not exactly ideal necessarily either. That would be more of a laminar flow, and you know everything's moving equally and equidistant and nothing's really changing. But if you see the food going up and down and ricocheting around and going this way and going that way, you've got some chaotic flow. The surface of your tank should be rippling. It should not look still. You should not be able to look up at the underside of the surface of your tank and see oil slicks on the top. All that should be crystal clear, and we want to ripple and ricochet. We want your lights to go through it, and we want the lights to go through the ripples and create what are called glimmer lines across your reef. That happens specifically with very certain lights. Metal halides are an example, which is what I use. Uh, it can be from the AP700 that has a single point of light, the LED. The brand new Kessel is probably another good example of a single point of light that will give you the glimmer lines. Where a light fixture, for example, SB Reefs, or uh, like the lights Dwayne uses, I don't even know what brand they are, they're from eBay. They have like, I don't know how many, a hundred LEDs on them. It can be very hard to get glimmer lines from so many points of light. You're going to pretty much just get a lot of light. And those lights, and I'm not shooting anyone down, I'm just telling you my personal reaction. Lights that have a lot of LEDs in them tends to get that disco effect on the sand where I can look at the sand and I see blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, just oomts, 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 oomts. I can't stand it. I mean, it drives my, night, my eyes crazy. So I like single point of lighting. But you need really good lighting for your SPS corals. And you need the lights to be the correct distance off the water. And then the corals have to be the correct distance from the surface of the water so they get adequate lighting. And that comes into measuring PAR. And my talk at Reef of Palooza next weekend will be about PAR. And I'm actually going to do some fresh measurements of all my systems for that presentation that I'm doing, which I think is on Saturday. And Reef of Palooza takes place in Southern California in the Orange County area. And you can just go to reefofpalooza.org and probably click Southern California and it'll give you all the details. I think it's 20 bucks to get in and it's two days long and there's going to be a lot of vendors there and there's going to be some speakers there, including myself. I've been using metal halides for my SPS corals for... Oh, 13, 15 years, I guess. That sounds about right. I had power compacts first. That was my first uh, attempt. And I got some very easy SPS corals. So what's an easy SPS coral? Uh, let's talk about that. Pacillopora, super easy. Can actually grow so well that it can drop babies elsewhere in your tank. And suddenly you'll see a Pacillopora growing on the back glass. Or on the top of a piece of lock line tubing. Or elsewhere on the rockwork. You didn't have to frag it. It actually sent a polyp out into the flow and it landed somewhere else, took help, hold, and is growing there. Another SPS coral that is very popular and very easy to keep is going to be the bird's nest coral. And bird's nest grows really fast and it dies really fast. So enjoy the ride while it lasts. <laughs> and if it does die, if you watch this beautiful bird's nest colony grow in your tank and then a bunch of it dies, just leave it alone. Give it a few days till it stops dying because there's so little mass to it, it it's not going to hurt your reef. You know, even if your tank is small, it's not going to hurt anything to just sit there and die off because there are going to be little pieces that live. Snip off everything that lives and make yourself a little pile somewhere in your tank and just let it grow into itself again and it will become a new bird's nest colony. So don't be discouraged. Uh, sometimes water parameters get out of whack and that coral goes up in smoke like that and there you are. Now, Montipora digitata is the one that grows like fingers, little sticks. And then Montipora capricornis makes the plates, you know, the, the circular discs. And sometimes they whirl and they look beautiful. They kind of, you're looking down on the top of the coral and it looks like a rose. That's a very simple coral to keep. It's in the SPS family. It's not an acropora though. Uh, so that would be one that you could do. But since we're talking about acropora specifically, I need to quit talking about bird's nest and Montipora and digitata. Um, Acropora. All right, so some of you have probably heard of a coral called the Walt Disney, and it is very expensive. If you're new to the hobby, you do not need to be buying a Walt Disney coral because it's a lot of money, and then when you kill it, you're gonna be really mad at yourself. <laughs> so I'm gonna recommend something easier. The funny thing is, 
Some of the easiest Acropora corals have been the hardest for me to keep alive over the years. Uh, I am known as the tort slayer because I've killed so many blue torts and I cannot keep green slimer to save my life. <laughs> and those are the easy ones. Those are old school acros that everyone had in their tank. They had this beautiful green staghorn called a green slimer and you can Google that. Beautiful colony, definitely worth having. I have none. Uh, and then blue tort. I have killed so much tort over the years. You know, I get frags from people. Okay, so let me specify this before, you know, someone from PETA writes a vicious thing on this stream. We get our corals from other people's corals. We're not ripping them out of the ocean and reefs, so don't fear that. Almost every coral I ever get has come from hobbyists or it's come from aquaculture facilities where they grew frags into little tiny mini colonies and then I purchased them for money or sometimes they were given to me from a friend. I've flown home with corals many times in the airplane, uh, Acropora specifically, and I put them in my tank and I try to grow them and blue torts just kept dying. And I have two or three different ones in my reef right now that are coming up on one year's anniversary and they're still alive. So I guess maybe I can give the tort slayer name to someone else because I think I'm off the hook finally. And I'm very happy with the growth I'm getting. They grow in slowly, but they're vivid, vivid blue. They are so beautiful. It is a great Acropora color, uh, color to add to your tank when you're planting your Acropora in your aquarium. We normally like to take Acropora and put them on the middle of the tank. So and I'm pretending this, this is the base of my tank and here's the middle of the rockwork and here's the water at the top. You usually like them around this area. It's open, the flow is going across the rocks, all the corals are getting blown off on a regular basis so they stay clean and pristine and they're getting a lot of light. But when you're buying brand new Acropora, I always say put it down on the sand and leave it alone to let it settle in. There is no reason to take a brand new coral that you got and put it up high under your intense lighting because you don't know what lighting it had before you got it. I mean, maybe you do. Maybe you say, oh, I got it from my friend Steve and his is up high, so I'm gonna put mine up high. I understand that desire, but the thing is is that you pulled the coral out of Steve's perfect water. It's been a very happy coral. And now you put it in your tank, different water parameters, different neighbors, different lighting intensity, different flow, you handled it, you dipped it in the chemical solution to kill any kind of pests, all of that equals or adds up to a really pissed off at little Acropora. So put that guy in the sand bed, or if you must, you can install a frag rack in your tank down low with little holes and you can set it in there, but I hate frag racks in display tanks. I think it's, hate it, hate it, hate it. I tell everyone don't do that. But if you must, temporarily, while the new coral is getting used to the system, you could put it in one of those things and stick it down low. Now, after the coral's been in your tank for about two weeks, and you're gonna have to keep an eye on it. You're gonna have, you know, a fighting conch knock it over. You're gonna have uh, hermit crabs climbing up and down it. You know, all this stuff's gonna go on for a little bit. Uh, a fish might knock it over. You might have a shrimp that, uh, a shrimp goby pair that try to put sand on it. You know, you have to keep track of your coral. After you've had it for a couple of weeks in your system and it's doing well, you can move it up somewhat. I'd move it up a quarter of the way up the rock where find a spot and park it there. And then another couple of weeks, now finally put it in its final spot. Some of the higher end lighting fixtures that exist like the Radeon will allow you to set your tank to acclimation mode. And what that does is it changes all of your lighting to a lesser intensity. So your entire reef is getting less light but that new coral is getting new light, should we call it? And then each day it increases a couple of percent, a couple of percent. And then after about two, three, four weeks, you're back to your maximum intensity that your tank is normally at. And all your corals in the tank have tolerated this less intensity while your new guy's getting used to more and more intensity day after day after day and building up, like I said, an immunity to it so it can handle it. And that way it doesn't turn bone white. All right, now, if you have an Acropora coral that gets their tips burned, which happens when you overdose something, when your water parameters swing, when your lights are on too long or they're too bright, the, the acro standing up and the tip just looks bone white. And I, I don't mean, okay, so this is another thing, especially for someone new to the coral. The very, very tip could look white-ish, but it's still tissue, it's still meat. 
maybe take your phone and put it on the glass and zoom in and that way you can kind of see if it's still tissue or if you're looking at an exposed bone like if i took the meat off my finger and you just saw a bone sticking up the tip of my finger is dead okay but if you if the the skin is just pale if it's white that's normal but if it's bone white what you may need to do to help that acropora survive i wouldn't ignore it because usually once that tip is exposed and it's just bone white algae will grow on the tip and you'll have hair algae growing right there on the surface and now you got acropora skin and then you got hair algae on the tip and it looks hideous so take some bone cutters snip off the bone and then apply a drop of glue right on the surface and that will act like a band-aid and then the skin of the acro will heal over that spot and it'll continue to grow upward so sometimes you may do something that you end up burning the tips of many acros and you'll have to trip, trim off all those tips and then put glue on the top of all of them. Underwater, it's fine. Uh, there's different brands. The new glue I showed you guys recently from Polyp Labs. I, I'm actually getting some to sell in my shop. So if you need that, uh, they have these little individual uh, tubes that you can squeeze underwater. The Ecotech glue I've been recommending for years, you can use that bottle underwater. And you're just applying a blob on the tip of each one of these acros you had to trim. And that way you prevent algae from growing on the tip and the coral can heal. Um, let me see what else I want to say. The biggest thing I want you to try with all your might to do is to keep your hands out of the tank. <laughs> and that may be hard for some of you, but it is the method that works for me. And when you see pictures of my reef, a lot of people say that is the most natural reef they've ever seen. And I appreciate that comment and that compliment. And I like to think it's very natural looking as well. That was my intention when I set it up. I did not want to look man-made. I don't want to look like a fruit cart, you know, where you have all the different fruits in their compartments. I don't want it to look staged. I want it to look like it's growing naturally and intertwining. And I have to go in there and snip some things here and there occasionally. And I'm kind of in the mood to do it, but my frag system water parameters are off because I wasn't testing. So now is not a great time to put corals from my reef into that tank. I gotta get that straightened out, which will take a week or so. Now, I know that we keep going back to dosing, but dosing is so important when it comes to acropora care that you cannot neglect it. You know, we've talked about this water parameters. Well, the best way to maintain proper water parameters is to dose every single day. What I used to use many years ago and still exists to this day is called ESV. E-S-V, B-Ionic. And that stuff is a two-part solution. There are products you can buy from Bulk Reef Supply. Uh, there's stuff I sell in my website from ME Coral. Uh, Two Little Fishies makes all kinds of liquid and powders that you can mix up to add alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium to your tank. And those need to be added on a regular basis to keep these numbers in the perfect area at all times. And if you can't keep them in that perfect area, your corals are not going to thrive. Matter of fact, they may just sit there stagnant. And you're going to have to make sure your dosing pumps are running properly, that the solution hasn't run out, that the tubing isn't kinked, that the tubing isn't clogged. You have to make sure it's in circulation and you have to measure for it on a regular basis. And if you can do all that and keep your hands out of the tank itself and not touch the corals on a regular basis, they should do well. If you continually poke at, touch, snip, remove, move, glue, re-glue, if you're doing that all the time, you're gonna see your corals are not gonna do well. And lastly, they do not grow fast, but they're not slow growers like you might be led to believe from watching television. For some reason, certain corals in our oceans do grow very, very slowly. And typically we're talking about those giant maize or brain corals. You know, they're the size of a VW bug. And yeah, those things probably grow a few millimeters every year because they're having to make a ginormous boulder even bigger to appear larger. But in Acropora, uh, I put in stuff about this big in my reef a year ago when Dwayne helped me take out all those giant corals. And if you haven't seen that video yet, you should watch it because it's pretty impressive. <laughs> The acros there that were this size then are about this size now, and they are multiple branches. They are bigger than a baseball, I guess, would be a good comparison, where they started off as something about the size of a golf ball. So that is my growth 
rate. The shadow caster coral has grown much faster by comparison to the other corals. It was, uh, you know, a ginormous two foot by three foot section that we ripped out of the tank. And Dwayne was determined to put one little piece and I couldn't stand it. I was like, nope, I am not doing that. I'm not going back to, it looked like a six inch twig. I was like, no. So I grabbed another giant twig and threw it on top of it to double my, my odds. And now that coral has grown quite a bit. And then of course, keep in mind too, other corals are gonna fight for space. And in my case, the sea bay anemone, which is that giant beast of a coral, of a, well, anemone, has brushed up and killed a whole section of the shadow caster, but the shadow caster don't care. It just goes the other direction and it goes up and it goes away. And I've left all the death where the sea bay touches. So every day it can touch that area and not do more death. And that is my method for keeping a mixed reef where I'm not, if I just ran only SPS corals, this would be a lot easier but I'm too stubborn. I like my LPS corals and I like my anemones and I like uh, chalices and uh, gorgonians and I, I need to get some clams. I haven't had those in forever. But these are the things that I want you to learn about today and I think that's pretty much it. So I hope that you found that informative. I don't think I left out anything. Bottom line, keep those parameters perfect. So now let's switch gears. I wanna talk about some new, new products. Uh, that's why I've got all this stuff behind me because these all arrived in the last couple of days and it feels like Christmas over here. So we'll start with this one first. So this was a product that snuck out at Macna that I completely did not know anything about. Fosban L stands for Fosban Liquid. So Fosban is a GFO product that is, you know, rust and you use it to bind phosphate from the water to remove it inside a reactor. Fosban L is a liquid that is very concentrated and you need to dilute it and then you need to drip it into your system very slowly. On the bottle, it says over a period of days. So very, very slow drip. I don't even know, it almost sounds like a manual thing. Like you walk by the tank and you put in a couple of drips and you come back 10 minutes later and you do a couple of drips and you just do that all day on Saturday. <laughs> uh, I wanted to try it. They were nice enough to give me a bottle. I had actually ordered stuff from Two Little Fishies, you know, for my shop and one of my bottles of Revive completely, the lid came off during shipping and poured everything out into the entire shipment. And so I said, well, I need a new bottle. And while you're at it, could you send me one of these? And they actually gave me one, so that was nice. It says on here that this is 33% lanthanum chloride. Or, actually it says lanthanum chloride, 33% solution in water. So maybe it becomes 33% once you've diluted it. I don't know, I'm just reading the label. I am definitely gonna try this out. You guys know I love Phosphate RX. I have never been worried about running Phosphate RX, but I wanted to try this just to see what's like. And since my tank just happens to be 0.75 ppm phosphate, it's the perfect time to try out something new. Julian Sprung is the owner of the company, and he said in the video I watched recently that you should dose it into a five micron sock, and all I have are 10 micron socks. So that is something I'm gonna be trying out. And uh, I'll let you know what I think. I finally got one of these. Uh, I've been told by Coral View they wanted me to, you know, try it out. And then when I finally placed my order to restock my shop, they charged me for it. <laughs> so I bought this. Super excited. was going to use it right before the stream and tell you guys about it. And unfortunately, I apparently have gotten myself a lemon or I have some bad batteries. But it's in a nice box that has the instructions right here. And I put the batteries in there, but it just will not turn on. So... That is gonna be a to be continued story, but I was kind of wanting to try it out today. So I'm a little bit bummed about that. I also got a controller. This is from the company called Inkbird, or at least that's the name of the product. And I've heard about this thing and they reached out to me a couple weeks ago and said, hey Mark, if we send you one, would you talk about it? And I said, yeah, I'd like to give it a try. So. I, um, this is not the official review. I'm just showing you what came in the box. I'm at, uh, opening it for the first time in front of you. So there is some kind of a dual plug here. And then we have a connect. This is gonna be a temperature probe of some type. And I think this is a humidistat to like measure the humidity of the room as well. So this is something new they came out with. So I'm going to be telling you guys about that in the very near future. 
and hopefully it's awesome. And then maybe when I do my thing about it, then perhaps they'll give a coupon code or something to save you guys some money. So this is something brand new coming to market. Uh, just so you, if you're wanting to look it up right now because you can't stand waiting, it's the ITC 608 T as in Tom. So that is something I will be playing with on my frag system. Then I got all these little blue bottles. So I'm going to just rattle them off to you really quick. I mean, they all look exactly the same. It's a bottle. So this one here is Coral Power Amino, as in amino acids. This one is Coral Power Grow. And then I have Coral Power Traces A, B, and C. And I have been told within a couple of days of putting that in my tank that my corals will look more puffy. <laughs> so I am going to do it. I actually asked for directions on how to use them, wrote it down, and I think I threw the paper away. So I've got to double check my uh, dosing requirements for those, make sure I get my facts straight before I put anything in my tank. Uh, someone asked, oh, someone mentioned their revive bottle leaked as well. Uh, the funny thing is that bottle, like I said, I mean, the lid was off and the bottle's on its side and the entire box was soaked. It just smelled of pine salt because that's what this smells like. You know, it's uh, pine tree oil or something. But it was inside other boxes. So fortunately, it didn't like ruin everything, but I, an entire bottle was empty. And all the other bottles that I reached out of the box, I could do a quarter twist tight on every one of them. It's like, ooh. So it's almost like the machinery that closed them didn't close them all the way. So I, of course, tightened them all. And uh, the new one that came in, completely fine, no leaks. So finally, the most exciting part. I am so excited about this. So I've been kind of talking about this thing for a few weeks now, and it arrived yesterday. So this is Camor. This is a continuous dosing pump designed for calcium reactors. And so I will obviously go into its use when I do my calcium reactor video that I have been teasing about for much too long. There are a couple of sections of tubing. And then I gotta show you this pump. This is my power supply. And there are some tubing connectors. So check out this little pump. So this is the pump itself. It moves the water in and out on the side instead of pointing down. And it's got rubber feet on the base, power plug on the back. You adjust the speed here on the front and it's dead silent. And I'm gonna be running it on my calcium reactor. Now, let me tell you about this thing. This right here is designed to run 24 hours a day. It is not used for like dosing caulkwasser or alkalinity because nothing runs 24 hours a day but a calcium reactor constantly has water going in to send water out filled with alkalinity and calcium this little guy here retails 270 bucks and when i held this in front of the current device that i have on my sump that is feeding my calcium reactor this this whole thing is just the dosing head of my brick of a machine that is designed for medical purposes and I saw this video, I think Coral View released the video about this thing about three weeks ago. And the minute I saw it, I got super excited. Then I'm at Macna and I saw it. And I was like, oh my God, there it is. It's here, it's here. <laughs> I want it. And he says, yeah, you can order it when you get back home. And so I you know, placed my order for Coral View. Again, I have been buying everything for my shop so I can fill your orders. And so this was in my package and I'm super excited to get it. And I'll be hooking it up shortly. And it will take over, the, it actually fits on the rim of my sump perfectly. I, I did a test just to see where I could put it. I was thinking about putting a huge magnet right on top and then stick it to my steel stand and let it just hang. But I don't know if a magnet would affect the, the, the innards. I, I don't know. The other choice would be to make an acrylic bracket and then put a magnet here and a magnet here. And that way it can be up on the steel stand, but the magnets aren't affecting the motor itself. But yeah, super excited about this for me. This could be used for, you know, if, if you're not running a calcium reactor, you want to do a water change. You could use a couple of these bad boys and you could pump water out and pump water in. You'd have a high end pump. And I'm talking about this thing like it's gold, like it's the best thing on the planet. I don't even know. I hope it'll hold up. I have no idea. I don't even know what the warranty period is, but I, I'm really thinking the best for it because why would they sell something that's garbage? And uh, you know, for something that costs almost $300, it should be high, high end. So I'm excited about it. And I am hoping that it will be awesome. So that's all of that. 
Um, if you're still in the stream right now, wow, it shows 163 of you guys are on here right now. That's awesome. Please hit a thumbs up if you like the stream. I'm hoping it wasn't laggy. And uh, like last week, oh my God, my camera was so bad in that stream and Jerry's camera was perfect, which just proves beyond a shadow of a doubt, my MacBook Pro cannot do anything anymore. So I am debating, do I buy a new MacBook Pro for $4,000? Do I buy a new iPad Pro for $1,300? Do I buy a PC tower for $1,700, $1,800? Do I buy an actual Mac computer and tie it in because I'm, you know, stationary here at my desk for three or four thousand dollars oh it's just so hard to make the right choice i cannot make up my mind and i don't want to waste the money on the wrong thing my gut is saying get the new macbook pro four thousand dollars it's just so much money and i know that you know because i have to buy the one with the highest processor the most ram and a terabyte of hard drive space i gotta have it because i edit so many videos and that way i'll have it for everything and it'll be portable too, which would be nice. I really don't want a PC tower. I know it's cheaper, but I walked away from Windows a long time ago, and I still, to this day, read mess uh, posts from people on Facebook saying, Windows just updated, it lost all my work, or Windows decided to no longer talk to my mail and has lost all the mail I've ever had on my computer, and I'm hoping to realign my database and get them to communicate. I'm like, oh my God, I'm so glad I'm not using Windows anymore. And I'm not a basher, I use Windows forever. <laughs> I finally switched to Mac about mm, five years ago and I just went all in and I've really enjoyed my Mac environment. And I, I know this, this is a huge, you know, it's like Mac versus PC, Apple versus Android, I get all that, but I'm not debating it. I'm saying I'm really happy with what I have. My whole house, my router, my Apple TV, my Mac, my phone, my iPad, it's all Apple and it all talks to itself and it's really great. So I don't really want to go that direction. So, if I get the iPad Pro, I can use that Switcher app that you saw and use a couple of remote iPhones to do multiple cameras. And I thought one camera at me and one camera from above that could point straight down and I could tap the screen. And then when I'm holding a product in front of me, you could see it from above. If I'm mixing something, you could watch it that way. And that would allow me to do it right here in front of you guys in a pretty decent environment. So yeah, I'm excited about that. The reef tank is doing absolutely fine. And that's, uh, okay, I started this conversation at the beginning, but I didn't get into it because I wanted to talk about Acropora. But now that we're at the end, I wanted to emphasize how my reef tank is the same thing day in and day out. So I don't find it to be enthralling or interesting to where I have news. There, I have little you know, snippets of news like, oh, I got a new pump, you know, or uh, I've tried out a scraper or whatever it is. But the livestock stays the same. I'm not buying new livestock. I'm not buying new fish. That's not even something I want to do. Everything in my tank is stable and clean and healthy. And I'm not shopping for more corals. And I'm not desiring to add more fish necessarily. I just am not. And when you try and add fish, you end up with disease. You know? <laughs> and you have to fight that. Or you have to deal with a quarantine system for like we talked about last week for six, eight weeks or so. At minimum of three weeks. Uh, you can do the safety stop like I recommend, and that'll save you some time, but there's a chance an internal parasite would release into your tank because safety stop only deals with external parasites. But, so yeah, my tank is what it is, and I can show you close-ups. I can do macro pictures with my Nikon of the different corals, and you know I love doing that, and I, I get in a mood, and I start taking a ton of pictures, and I, I send them out to Instagram and Facebook and you know, my blog on milosreef.com. And that's how I share my stuff. But I don't have like, oh, look, I got a new clam. Oh, look, I got a new gorgonian. Oh, look, I got a new shrimp. Oh, look, I got that. You know, for me, something new and exciting would be me adding 500 cleanup crew critters to my reef. <laughs> so. I would like to just wrap this up. We are going into an hour and I ignored you guys on the chat. So what I'm going to do I'm going to look at this chat as soon as this video is done and, and compiled and you know it's on YouTube officially. I am going to put a link in this video's description to Acropora Care. I have a great article that covered a lot of things I talked about. So that way you don't have to keep rewatching this over and over. It's good to watch it, but to read about something will help you commit it to memory. Uh, an old trick my teacher taught me a long time ago is read it out loud. <laughs> so you hear it while you're reading it and it, you're using all your senses. 
but the Acropora Care article will really help you be successful. And then I am going to go to this chat and I'm going to find all the questions that were not answered and I'm going to address them. I'm going to make a separate video and that video is going to be uploaded to Facebook this evening. So if you're not aware, I do these live streams on Saturday on YouTube and then I do follow up, which is an edited content that's about eight to 11 minutes long where I hit on a few questions that were omitted or you know, were missed and you can watch them on my Facebook page, which of course is facebook.com slash Milo's Reef. And then I share it into my new group, which is called Club Milo's Reef, which is facebook.com slash groups slash Milo's Reef. And you can go right there and you can go ahead and you can jump into the conversations. We're averaging about 50 new posts a day. We have around 2,200 people involved. We have six moderators that are keeping the peace. And we are having a lot of very happy people that are enjoying the group because there's no aggression. There is, it's not allowed. Uh, there's no uh, disparaging remarks. I basically t tell everyone, and this is absolutely the one rule of the group, you treat others kindly or you're thrown out forever. There's no second chances. So words matter. Hashtag words matter is actually a thing. And you have to treat others kindly. And if you are not in a good mood, don't get in the group. And if you are seeing something you don't like, don't say anything at all. And if you see something you can help with, give them some advice. That's the whole point of the group, to help each other. And the nice thing is people can go into that group and they can ask a question without fear of reprisal, without fear of being attacked, without fear of being put down. And even the moderators that watch everything watch my posts and like, wow, Mark, you handled that really nicely. <laughs> And it's like, because I'm the same guy all the time. I don't act a certain way and then change later. I literally do care. I might scream at the room about something I didn't like, but I don't post it. You know, I just try to be positive at all times. And I want you guys to be positive. And I want you guys to have successful tanks. And I want this channel to be educational. And I want you to buy things from my shop. Last weekend, I told everyone, please buy from my shop to help me with some dental work. And it worked. About 10 or 15 of you bought something within... 48 hours. Thank you so much for doing that. I had 25 orders this week um, that came in and I got 20 of them out. So there, you know, some of the bigger stuff is still on the workbench. But if you can buy things from melovesreef.com, you are helping me pay my bills and helping me continue to do these videos. I'm not asking for free money. I'm asking you to buy things you need for your aquarium anyway. And these are the things that I use myself and I trust them and I discuss them and I recommend them. That's why I sell them. And I also, of course, sell things I build. So if you're saying I need a skimmer stand and I want it to be this wide and this narrow and this tall, I'll make it. And if you say, well, I want something for my auto feeder, I make those already. And if you say I need a lid for my overflow box so algae doesn't grow in there and fish don't jump in, I make those too. And if you say I need a top off container, I make those as well. So use me and help me get a little bit richer so I can give it all to the dentist. <laughs> Guys, I hope you have a nice weekend. Please test your water today. Be like me, Lev. Test your water. And then I want you to take those results. I want you to post them. If you're using the Reef Trace app, you can share it straight out of that app to your favorite social media. Or you can do like me and take a screenshot and then I share it manually because I kind of like to edit the way I'm going to show it. And you can do that as well to get your parameters out there so we can all see how you're doing, how your tank is doing. And maybe we'll see something you didn't think was a problem and we can give you some advice on how to correct that one minor thing. Other than that, clean your collection cups. I mentioned that last week as well. Do it again. I'm going to do mine today. Everything else is done on my reef, but I do need to clean out my two collection cups. That's it, guys. Have a great weekend.